So that was more theory than you're going to need at A-level. Certainly that equation that I popped up was way more than you're going to need at A-level. Well, at A-level, what you need to understand is that in the same way that UV and visible spectra correspond to electrons jumping from one energy level to another, well, infrared spectra corresponds to bond vibrations jumping from one energy level to another energy level. Infrared spectra associated with bonds. Now, for your A-levels, you're given a data sheet that contains something like this, where you're given a whole list of bonds and you're given a whole list of so-called wave numbers and possibly a comment with them there. And I'm going to use that same table, that same type of table, all the way through the rest of these movies. But before I go any further, it is worth thinking about what do I mean by this wave number? I will often say wave number in per centimeter or reciprocal centimeters, but I'll also sometimes talk about frequency. What gives? Why am I so indeterminate? Well, to get the answer to that, let's just think about what we mean generally by light being absorbed. We say that that light has all the different photons of different energies, and that when an electron pops from one level to another, it has absorbed a particular photon. It has absorbed a particular energy of light. Well, in the same way that when a bond vibration goes from one vibration to a higher energy vibration, it has absorbed that particular photon of light, that particular energy of light. Now, if you think about our knowledge of light, we know that the energy is proportional to the frequency of the light. And that frequency is measured in per second. And that per second for frequency comes from the relationship that the wavelength of light times the frequency of the light is C, the speed of light. OK, but essentially what we're saying here is that the wavelength and the frequency of light are inversely proportional. Multiply the wavelength times the frequency, you get a constant. So they're inversely proportional. So this wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down. Now that is, of course, measuring frequency in per second. And what we mean by that is that if you were to stand there watching the wave go by, the frequency is the number of waves per second that passed you. But there's an alternative way to think about frequency based on the idea that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. And specifically in this case, if we think of wavelength, which is a length, as being not in meters, but in centimeters, well, then the inverse of centimeters is one over centimeters. And so we can think about frequency in terms of per centimeter, otherwise known as the wave number. The way to think about this physically is just take a wave and lay down a ruler and how many wavelengths are there in a centimeter. OK, now it's convenient to use wave numbers when we're talking about infrared spectroscopy because the numbers are just a nice size. I could talk about the wavelength, but it would be a kind of yucky 0 0.000 something. I could talk about the frequency in per seconds, but then it would be times 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 12 and so on. When I talk about it in wave numbers, it's actually a really nice number between about 500 and 3600. So that's why we use frequency in terms of wave number per centimeters. It's just a convenient number. But what we need to remember is that it's still related to the energy of the photons. The higher the wave number, the higher the energy. So the higher the wave number, the more energy to make that bond vibrate at a different energy level. Now, going back to the table and just essentially expanding on what we talked about in the previous movie, the highest wave numbers, the highest absorptions of infrared photons and bonds by bonds is by bonds to hydrogen. So you can see nitrogen to hydrogen. It absorbs, absorbs photons that have a wave number 3300 to 3500. OH 3200 to 3600 or in acids 2500 to 3300. Carbon hydrogen 2800 to 3100. OK, so the highest absorbances are usually associated with bonds to hydrogen. 
Now, then we also said in the previous movie that the stronger the bond, the higher the frequencies. And so after we've got rid of the bonds to hydrogen, the next ones that we see are triple bonds. We already saw a carbon oxygen triple bond at 2146. Well, carbon carbon triple bonds, 2100, 2200. Carbon nitrogen triple bonds, 2100 to 2250. So if you've got a triple bond in there, you're going to see some kind of absorption in this 2100 to 2250 wave number range. After triple bonds are double bonds. So there's the whole string of double bonds. I won't go into it too deeply. I then say that I'm counting benzene here and I'm putting benzene as a C double bond C in quotes, mainly because there wasn't a convenient way in this table to do that sort of partial bond where a whole bond and then a, a dot 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 bond. But one expects, of course, the bonds in benzene because that electron is delocalized over to be weaker than regular double bonds. And indeed, we see that it has an absorption slightly less than a full-fledged carbon-carbon double bond. We'll talk more about that in a later movie briefly. And then finally, we've done triple bonds, double bonds, so single bonds down here. Although, as you'll see from a discussion in a later movie, a lot of times the single bond information isn't very much use to a casual user of infrared spectroscopy. Now, the last column in my table says comment and this is just contains some form of the words weak medium strong and broad and this just talks about how much is actually absorbed something that you don't really talk about at a level but that there's not one simple absorption amount associated with different things different bonds will absorb different numbers of photons not that the bond will absorb a particular photon, but they are particularly good at absorbing that energy. Whereas other bonds might sort of see just the right kind of photon and say, hey, I'm not going to absorb that today. It's a very much simplified explanation of it. But essentially, some bonds really, really, really give good signals in the infrared spectroscopy, give good strong signals. Other ones like a carbon carbon triple bond, the signals are so weak, a lot of times you don't even see them. Now, in broad generalization is that the more polar a bond is, the stronger the signal is going to be. And in particular, infrared spectroscopy is really, really useful for thinking about bonds to oxygen. So carbon oxygen single bond strong, carbon oxygen double bond strong, carbon oxygen triple bond, not here, but very strong, OH bond, very strong. And then NH, and then a little bit less electronegative than oxygen, so the bond's not as polar. So you see instead of uh, strong, it's medium. Instead of it being strong here, it's medium. Instead of being strong here, it is medium. So the really good signals in infrared spectroscopy come from the very polar bonds. So as you're, we're finished with this whole set of movies, you'll probably realize that really the only time infrared's useful is when you got oxygens or nitrogens in a compound. But anyway, I create spoilers as I say things like this. Let's move from general into specifics.